Welcome to the eighth lecture in this series and the, the first of the third batch of lectures. And this one is on long distance mobilities. And um, the reason for that is that it is both highly unequal and hugely damaging from the environmental point of view. This is a slide we use with uh, our undergrads teaching and uh, it captures those two effects quite, quite neatly, I think. Sort of 10% of the population are making over 60% of the flights in, um, in the UK. I'm not sure what the figures are for Belgium or for Flanders, but I, I wouldn't expect them to be hugely different. And we can see that the CO2 emissions from a flight to London, New York and back are about the same as what you, uh, uh, what, you, what you cause if you're heating your home for a year. And then we don't really know that much about what happens with all these emissions that happen at very high altitude. We know that they're more damaging, but we don't quite know how much. So today I want to talk about what this means in the context of justice. I want to talk about the consequences of the pandemic for long distance travel and particularly for aviation and I want to reflect on ways of intervening and trying to reduce emissions. Let's go back to some information I've pre presented before to refresh your memory as much as mine. You can see that this is all emissions from transport combined and long distance uh, mobility sit in various categories. The share is considerable and it kind of is hidden both in the road transport and the rail transport and in sea and air and probably more in freight than in passenger transport. The key issue however is one of definition because there's no universally agreed definition as to what constitutes long distance mobility. And if you look at the literature, you'll see a range of different definitions um, that vary, f I guess, across studies and to some extent across geographical contexts. So I would say the definition question remains one of fairly ad hoc threshold values. This is another slide that I've shown before. And I think it's useful to repeat it again because it shows the, the, the rapid growth in shipping and aviation where most of the long distance mobility is, is concentrated. And of course, these are percentages. So you start from a lower base, so the growth is, is, is greater, but still we can see very strongly how much the growth is uh, continuing, particularly for aviation, where there was a little bit of a dent for the financial crisis, but continued growth from uh, from there onwards. This is not a slide I've shown before, and actually I'm not supposed to show it because it is from the latest or well from the upcoming annual assessment report for the IPCC, and it says very strong. It, it says on the first page uh, uh, that you shouldn't, you shouldn't cite it, but I think it's a really nice figure. It's really too, leave, too good to leave out of this presentation because it, it illustrates some of the key challenges. Uh, for one, it shows that aviation, that, that long distance on the right hand side sort of sits at the level of niches. If you look at the vertical axis, you see uh, market commerciality low medium high. So it means niche scale. You can see that on the left hand side of the, of the block, which means we're mostly talking about demonstration, very early stages when we're talking about uh, technological innovation. This is sort of technological readiness levels, TRL three or four. So it sits at that interface between research and development where it's, we're talking about experimental proof or technolo technology validated in, in, in lab conditions. So mitigation in long distance mobility is more dependent on technology than other forms of mobility and there's a strong focus on hydrogen based propulsion. That means we're talking about a medium to long term before we sort of see genuine 
change and, and what change is happening until then will to some extent have to come about through some kind of demand management and that's very challenging because we've got these huge inequalities in participation in long distance mobility and we've got very significant growths in, in volumes that risk cancelling out any significant gains from policy and even from technological innovation. I think these areas are really important and there is research on both of them and we've got people in the room who've done research on this but I think there is a need for more research because the differences are really quite stark. This is from a paper by Stefan Gussling in, in Denmark which sort of looks at American adults and it sort of really shows that very unequal distribution of who is doing the flying is sort of more than half of people don't fly at all a third one to five trips and sort of really that band of 10 percent which are the frequent flyers who take uh, um, six or more trips uh, uh, per year so are really responsible for the for the bulk of your overall uh, number of trips now this is cross-sectional how does it look over time well not that much different this is uh, UK data it's based on the LCF survey the living cost in food survey which is an annual survey of approximately 6,000 households in the UK where people fill out an expenditure diary for two weeks and they compl complete an additional questionnaire for less frequent experience, uh, expenditures and flights are one of those and the household survey asks whether anyone in the household has taken a flight in the past 12 months and collects information on whether that was domestic or abroad and this is from a paper uh, by uh, Milena Buchs and, and Giulio Mattioli and what they've done is sort of look at inequalities over a period of 15 to, 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 to 17 years they've looked at the Gini coefficient which means the closer to one the more unequal the distribution and a score of 75 percent is actually pretty unequal and what we see is actually a slight downward trend in long term uh, it's small because the axis only goes from from 0.60 to 0.80 so the, the the, the, the decrease is very small but we also see an increase at a time of economic recession so we this makes sense sort of price sensitivity is greater uh, amongst uh, um, lower income households so uh, yeah what you would what you would expect there's a I think this is really useful to look at these kinds of statistics but I would also say that they're only the tip of the iceberg and there's a range of other studies in the mobility literature that have looked at this a little bit more broadly Wei Zhang Lin at the University the National University of Singapore is is one of those and he has argued for more work on what he calls aero mobility justice because the discrepancy in participation is resilient because of a range of different factors and processes for one it has to do with the very character of aeromobility you only create the high speeds in the system that allow you to travel large distances if you if you reduce the number of access points uh, Elon Salomon and Aaron Faiselson already wrote about this in, in around 2000s but the very nature of the system makes uh, sort of induces inequality but there's more because as Wei Zhang argues and others have shown as well Gordon Peary for instance if you look at the history of aeromobility it is deeply racialized going back to the colonial area the, the colonial colonial era where sort of uh, Gordon Peary in, in particular for Africa has sort of really looked at how the, the rise of aviation in Africa was uh, intimately bound up with the evolution of empire, the, the British Empire. So until this day, certainly in the global north, uh, 
aviation and participation in aviation remains largely white middle class and also disproportionately undertaken by men, certainly when we look at business travel. But there's more at stake here because of the whole, that there's a range of other historical processes that have locked in structural global inequalities in the system. And, and Wei Zhang describes them in, in a fair amount of detail in, in various publications. He talks about how um, air rights have historically, uh, sort of in terms of their allocation, historically strongly favored the global north in terms of the expertise that is required, which, in which the international civil, civil aviation organization plays a very strong role. It sets standards and, and norms for expertise and it emerged in and from global northern countries. And you could say that countries elsewhere in the world continue to lag behind and having to catch up with countries in, in the global north. And not least, the whole system of airport security, aviation security, is uh, locking in all kinds of inequalities. Think about traveling to uh, a country like the US, sort of what you need in terms of passports, biometric data, border technologies. There's a whole set of, 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 uh, of factors involved there that are much more developed in northern countries and sort of not of the same standard, not of the same quality in, in large parts of the global south. So collectively, these regimes continue to ensure the competitive advantages of traditional air powers at the international level. And in the words of Wei Zhang, they splinter the future of people in profound ways, not just at the level of individuals in the manner that race, class and gender do, but also at the level of whole nations. So this notion of aeromobility justice really needs to be seen as multi-scalar. It's individuals, households, but also nations. And then there are further issues. And here the work of Mimi Shallow that I've referenced before, the book Mobility Justice is very helpful. And also the work of my colleague in Oxford, Debbie Hopkins, um, who's sort of written about aviation more in the context of, of tourism. And I think there are, there are three issues here because this is sort of the, the point, the typical mobility's point to make, I guess, is that immobility regimes enable the frictionless mobilities of business travelers and tourists. And friction here needs to be understood as a metaphor, the mobilities, mobility cap capabilities that individuals and groups enjoy. I talked about capabilities quite a bit in, in one of the previous lectures, in, in lecture five, and I used a slightly different terminology, sort of talked about security of capabilities and robustness of capabilities. But I think this notion of friction is worthwhile to work with. As well, it has some useful connotations in the current context, and, and as friction is travel enabled by particular technologies and institutions from passports, apps on your phones, selective airport lounges and hotels providing private chauffeurs to pick you up from the airport, all kind of capture. That sort of that notion of smooth travel that gives you this, this, this almost this, this sense of privilege, if you like. But this point here about immobility regimes enabling mobility is also playing on the, the key notion of the mobility stern, namely that mobility is relationally produced. Some people are or become mobile because others are immobile and are being immobilized. And think of the airport staff, the waiters in tourist resorts, the immigrants that do the cleaning jobs in the business hotels and so on and so forth. But this relational production also goes beyond the immobilization of people. It's also about material infrastructures or moorings in the words of John Uri 
and Mimi Scheller that are put in place and the financial investments that are required sort of think about tourist resource, resorts and, and all the investments that goes on there and obviously there's a link here with Harvey's work uh, on, on spatial fixes that I've talked about in one of the previous lectures as well and that sort of comes into play here as well. There's also quite a bit of interesting work in the mobilities literature on elite mobilities that uh, sort of uh, Mimi Scheller in her book Mobility Justice talks about and is very explicit about. She writes that mobility justice requires a principle of transparency so that deliberation and procedural justice can be applied and she really has nothing sort of she really dislikes the secrecy in which so much of this elite mobility is shrouded and uh, I think there's a whole research agenda around private jets, around private air charter services that really needs to be worked through much more carefully. I'll talk a little bit about it in, in a few slides. But I think this is really a key area for further research. So if anyone wants to work on this, please, I'll be very keen to, uh, to, to, to join you. Finally, then, there's sort of when we're talking about tourism, there is also the uneven exposure to the externalities of tourist mobilities and uh, what Debbie calls extra tourist transport. Um, this whole point is highlighted by Debbie in, in an uh, introduction, an editorial for the Journal of Sustainable Transport, um, where she argues that tourism-related mobilities are multifaceted and she makes this distinction between the transport movements of people versus these extra tourists, this, this extra tourist transport, which for her are the mobilities of stuff for tourism and tourists. Think of the mobilities of waste, of food, items, bedding in hotels and so on and so forth. And I would sort of like to extend that a little bit because I think it's not just the mobilities of, of stuff. Also think about the commuting of the workers in, in the tourism industry. So the, so the cleaners, for instance, who, who work in the business traveler hotels. Debbie also makes a distinction between different movements of tourists and, and I would say business travelers as well because it's quite useful to think about the movements from home to destination and vice versa and then the, 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 what she calls transport as tourism where sort of the moving is part of the it's, it's actually the tourism think about tracking uh, as, as, as one example and then sort of you have transport as, as you have these movements at the destination ends that I think also need to be studied in much greater details. And collectively, these forms of movement produce a series of externalities such as air pollution, noise pollution, road congestion, and so on. And they also contribute more indirectly to issues like urban sprawl, loss of biodiversity, particular labor conditions characterized by low pay precarity and in many tourist uh, destinations, strong seasonality as well. So a whole raft of issues that need to be considered in conjunction to these aero mobilities. And then this happened, COVID, and all these planes got grounded. And certainly at the beginning of the pandemic, I got quite a few messages from from, from journalists who were sort of very keen to, to hear my take on uh, the future of mobility and particularly the future of aviation. And people were thinking that things would be radically different and that we would move to a, well, possibly even a, a, a much more localized uh, future. And I've always been very careful and I said, well, don't let yourself be too much guided by the short term. Let's think about where we are five to ten years from now. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see that actually the, the pandemic isn't hugely different in terms, of the, the, in terms of the trend from what happened with the financial crisis about uh, sort of a little over ten years ago. 
So this question, will the, the COVID pandemic change all of this, is I think a really interesting one. This is another graph from a piece that has not been officially published. This is the accepted manuscript version of a paper by Franz et al. in Environmental Research Letters, which I think is a really nice analysis and really looks at some of these issues uh, of, of the, the long-term effects of the, of the COVID pandemic in a quite sophisticated way. Um, the authors have done, of this piece have done a number of different things. They've used a particular model, the energy demand generator for transport called HT, uh, to, to model demand for aviation in each country around the world until 20, 20, 2021. No, that doesn't make sense. 2100, that's the number. So it's long term, 80 years, on the basis of historical trend data and they use a function that sort of takes account of differences in population, GDP, transport price, income elasticity, and price elasticity. So quite conventional factors you would see, you would expect in a demand model. They've also used the, they, they've used three of the shared social economic pathway scenarios, SSPs for short, that differ in terms of demographic, economic, lifestyle, technology and policy trends. And they, they, they work with three, as you can see, SSP1, SSP2, SSP5. I'm not going to describe them in complete detail, but suffice it to say that SSP1 is characterized by low population growth in relative terms, high GDP growth, reduced global inequality, low material consumption, technological development away from fossil fuels, tight environmental regulation, both at national and global level. So all kinds of factors that sort of you would expect to be conducive to diminish growth in aviation. And in many ways, SSP5 is the opposite of that. Yes, it has low population growth and high GDP growth, but it has also a strong emphasis on materialism, high mobility as a sign of status, of social status, technological development that is primarily focused on, on fossil fuels. There are some restrictions on environmental regulation, but those are low typically at the national level. There's little on the global level, so poor global governance. The third thing the authors have done is to add COVID effects into the mix by reducing demand with a certain percentage that differs per year. And they also differentiate it between leisure and business travel and between the SSP scenarios. The reductions are greatest for 2020, which is what you would expect, a little bit less for 2021, a little bit less still for 2022 to 2023, still a little bit less for 2024, and then sort of it's back to normal, to pre-COVID trends. The effects, however, are differentiated for leisure and business. For leisure, there are no demand depressing effects expected after 2024. So business as usual for, for tourism, you could say. For business travel, they expect a structural depression as a result of new IT-dependent organizational practices developed during the pandemic. And that depressing effect is largest under SSP1, the scenario that sort of was already reducing the, uh, the, the growth, uh, where they sort of structurally expect for 50% depressing eff effect and it is smallest in SSP5 where they expect structurally 10% diminishment. Now the overall effects of all these things that they've looked at are expressed in terms of RPK which stands for revenue per passenger kilometer. Of course it's not a CO2 measure directly but at least it gives us a sense of where things are going. And 
what the authors conclude and what this diagram shows is sort of there's sort of really enormous differentiation in terms of what can happen under the most unfavorable circumstances we get an increase by a factor 10 by 2100 uh, that's sort of the red lines under SSP5 against a modest factor 2 increase in SSP1 there's a little there are other differences if you look you see that sort of there's a maximum and for, for the green lines, that happens around 2060, 2065, whereas in, in SSP5, that really happens towards the end of the, of the century. So the interesting thing about the pandemic is that that also differs significantly. It is much smaller in both relative and absolute terms in SSP five so in other words what this means is that whether the pandemic effects are going to be locked in depends not only on technological development where the shift away from fossil fuel technologies of course being hugely beneficial it also depends on a the strength of local and global governance in the short and long term and b a cultural shift a cultural change away from hegemonic norms and values configured around materialism, consumption and high mobility. The authors don't say, state this explicitly, but my interpretation is, is that the window of opportunity that the, the, the COVID pandemic is presenting is closing very, very rapidly. We sort of knew this, but I think it's quite nice to now see that actually being uh, being brought out by a model and a set of scenarios and of course there are all kinds of ways in which you can criticize this model and this whole exercise but i think it is at least in in its sort one of the most sophisticated versions of uh, of, of that kind of approach and i think it, it does really show some some very interesting insights now this is at the global level the authors do break it down to lower geographical scales. And I apologize for the quality of the diagrams, but this is really the best I could do, given that it's the accepted man manuscript uh, version. Um, what they show here is on the left-hand side, takeoffs and landings, so flight activity for Europe and Africa on, uh, on the right-hand side. And even though the authors authors do not account for the global regimes of air rights, aeronautical expertise and aviation security that I've talked before on the basis of the work of Wei Zhang Lin, or indeed any of the concerns raised by Mimi Scheller and Debbie Hopkins. There is, the analysis still reveals significant geographic variations, where in Europe we see a stabilization in SSB1, and an, a, an increase of only a factor four under SSP5. I mean, that's still huge, but it's sort of, it does mean there are quite stark differences between Europe and Africa on the right hand side, where we see under SSP5 a growth by a factor 15, roughly, against in the more benefit, sort of in the, in the SSP1 scenario a growth of by a factor three over this long period so still huge growth as you would expect but again there is quite significant opportunity for intervention there i want to go back to this point about elite mobilities and about private jet use because there's another paper that's been published very recently uh, by authors whose name I struggle a little to pronounce, but it is published in a, sort of the new journal Transportation Research Interdisciplinary Perspectives. And uh, what these authors have done is basically look at what has happened with private jet use versus other commercial aviation passengers in the US. So the left-hand side shows you uh, sort of annual cycles, 2014 
until July 2021. And you can see very clear annual rhythms uh, in, in the way the, the graph develops. Um, in fact, what we see up to 2020 is slight growth in the in, in the in the black line, it goes up ever so slightly. There's also less seasonal variation, which I think is a really interesting factor in and of itself. But what we see especially happening after a sort of an early 2020 is more rapid recovery um, and then further growth. And that's where the graph on the right hand side comes in, because it kind of shows you and you will, it, it shows the same information uh, for the, um, the uh, uh, private jet travel, sort of the annual cycli, and you see sort of the, the, the dotted line that drops sharply, then actually recovers quite sharply, so that by June 2020, we're already at a, a, not quite at the highest level, but we've sort of seen very significant recovery. And in fact, by March 21, we're already above pre-pandemic level. And that's sort of that, that dotted red line, it continues to increase significantly. So this would, ex this would suggest that the pandemic has triggered additional growth in this particular form of elite mobility. And the authors have then used this information to sort of do a little bit of a, of a, of a thought experiment, what would happen if these kinds of, if this growth is continuing all the way through uh, 2024. And they have sort of three scenarios to understand the CO2 implications. Where scenario one assumes that private jet travel will return to pre-pandemic levels by 2024. So that's where you get sort of the, the dotted line that steadily decreases. Uh, and by the yeah late 2024, we would be in a business as usual scenario from the pre-COVID situation. In scenario two, they assume that the level of private jet travel will remain unchanged through this period. And this would be plausible if private jet travelers do not increase their travel demand and do not find better commercial alternatives uh, for, the, for their flying. Scenario three assumes continued growth in private jet travel because the tastes of these wealthier travelers have continued to shift away from commercial air travel and their wealth has continued to increase because in the background what is playing here is that during the pandemic the the, the, the top percents of the income distribution have increased their wealth which if you would think about how demand for air travel works you would expect to have a sort of to increase their, uh, their, their demand for flying as well. So these are quite crude scenarios and quite simple scenarios, but I think it's sort of as a thought experiment, it works quite nicely because what they've done then in the table on the right hand side is try to summarize the implications of these scenarios. And the, the, the column in the middle sort of talks about the total CO2 equivalence by uh, sort of late 2024. Well, you probably can't read the numbers, but they're very big and they are very abstract. So under the, it goes from 770 to 940 megatons. I don't know what a megaton CO2 equivalent means. Neither do most of the readers of this paper, I would imagine. So what, they've, what the authors have done is translate these numbers in equivalent numbers of cars driven during for a year at the end of that period. And then they say, well, in the best scenario, scenario one, there would be 53.3 million additional cars on the US road network, up to roughly 65 million. That still is a little bit abstract, at least for a simple soul like myself. So what I've tried to do is relate this to the number of vehicles that are actually currently 
on the roads in the US. And I, I came across a number of roughly 290 million. So if, if that is right, then 65 additional cars in scenario three amounts to approximately 22.5% extra. Um, and in the best possible scenario of uh, um, 53 million additional cars, that would be about 18.5%. Now, these numbers are very crude. They don't take account of the growth in the vehicle park over that period 2020, 2024. But if you think about those numbers, about 20%, it really shows you the unevenness of the CO2 implications of elite mobilities by private jets in quite stark terms. There can be no doubt about the enormity of the distributive injustices that the pandemic-induced private jet use is generating. And more than that, it also raises questions about what we, as research community, are actually focusing on. Even if these numbers were 50% lower than I've just sort of uh, told you on the back of my, uh, sort of on the basis of my back of the envelope calculation, there would be a strong case for thinking about our research priorities. It's indeed very important to focus on everyday mobilities, but we also risk, we, we also run the risk, apologies, of, of sort of losing sight of the bigger picture and where sort of the real, where some of the real uh, increases in emissions are, are happening in quite a short period of time. So, as I said before, we need to do much more work on these types of mobilities if we want to be serious about radically reducing CO2 emissions. It was here that I had prepared a whole set of slides on freight and growth in freight volumes, but I've taken them all out because of the time. But I think there's a similar story there. There's a need for much greater attention to freight transport and the growth in freight volumes when we're thinking about CO2 emissions. Back to aviation. There is actually some really interesting work going on about how we can reduce emissions from aviation. This is from a paper by Stefan Gussling and uh, a colleague who have sort of done a, a, a qualitative assessment, you could say, of uh, policies to achieve climatically sustainable aviation systems. Climatically sustainable is the term that they used. It was published in Transport Reviews, the journal that, that Jonas is, is editing now. And I think, yes, there's a lot going on, but it's a really nice paper. So I think that there are three main things going on here. You see sort of different colored blocks, those different types of intervention. So why it is soft policy is things like information campaigns, awareness, uh, that, that sort of, yeah, psychological interventions. Market-based interventions is great as sort of pricing measures and budgeting measures and regulatory sort of top-down saying you can't do X, Y or Z is, is black. They've also looked at three types of targets, transport demand on the left-hand side, technology, right-hand, and the bottom, social norms. And then they've got these three concentric circles. And the further out, the more effective they deem that particular intervention to be. But look up the figure for yourself. I think it's one of the most comprehensive assessments that I have seen to date. And I really like this focus on effectiveness, the distinction between soft or voluntary, market-based or economic and regulatory measures, and Stefan has done that in other work as well. And I also like that they not only focus on technology, but they also look at demands, and particularly also on the social norms side, which usually is not taken into account. In, into account. So that kind of begins to move towards a systemic approach towards thinking about reducing emissions.
On the other hand, I would say there's still a rather narrow understanding of sustainability. Sustainability is really about reducing CO2 emissions. And of course, it's a bit unfair to make that point because the authors do not claim to be sort of comprehensive in their understanding of, of sustainability because it is about CO2. But there's no attention for questions of social sustainability, let alone questions of justice in this. The other point I would say I would make is that to me it is still a case of what I call classic transport thinking. And with that I mean that you try to solve the issue within the transport system itself rather than asking the question, what is aeromobility for? So in that sense, it's a little bit the equivalent of what in urban mobility is the distinction between trip-based approaches and activity-based approaches. You, don't, you think about just the trips, the movement, the transport in itself without linking it to why people move and, and sort of their need to participate in activities distributed across space and time. So, I think it's a really good paper, but I think we need to do more and we need to develop our thinking a little bit further. And I think what that means is that we need to think about social technical systems, yes, but also think of them as entangled, not just looking at the transport systems, but the systems that they are interacting with in all sorts of ways. I think we need to do more work on getting a heads around this question of the magnitude of the required change because a lot of the, the, lot of the interventions that are displayed in the, in, the, in the figure I've just shown you is, uh, is still about fairly incremental changes. I think we should not think about aviation in general, but we need to differentiate. We need to think about different kinds of aeromobilities. Hence, also, my consistent use of mobilities as a term in connection to aviation. And I think we, again, need to bring these questions of justice into the equation. I've shown this the diagram before. Last time I was, I was here is very well known these days, this sort of multi-level perspective. Uh, and I think it's very useful, not least for thinking about technological intervention that happens in niches where most technological alternatives to current propulsion systems sit. I mean, I mentioned that at the start when I was talking about this diagram from the assessment, the sixth assessment report from the, from the IPCC. I think this is sort of really useful to, to think about these kinds of things. I think it's also really nice to be, because it helps us to think about what systemic intervention entails. It's not just the tech, it is also the cultural norms, the markets, the demand side that Stefan Gussling was already emphasizing. And I would add is also about industry structure, it's about science and knowledge, and it is about infrastructure. Infrastructure is not shown in Frank Gills's diagram and here, but it should really be part of that, uh, of that figure as well. Because I think there is a lot to be said and done around airport expansion construction and the provision of alternatives, not least high-speed rail that Fred, for one, has done extensive work on as well. Still, this diagram is talking about single systems rather than entangled systems. So it's still, if we, uh, if we apply this to aviation, we still run the risk of talking only about the aviation system. And there's no social and geographical differentiation here either. The importance of thinking about entangled systems can be illustrated in a number of ways, but one of the ways in which this discussion has been going on in recent years in relation to aviation is by looking at our own practices as, a, as, as academics and sort of academic mobilities is now a, a, a body of literature that some people in this department led by Freke have been participating in as well. And I think what this work really shows is that changes required beyond transport as well if we want to reduce aviation, the demand for aviation. My university 
now is in the process of instituting a flight levy for every flight uh, we're supposed to, to, to pay, uh, I think, well, I forgot what it is, but it's a significant amount that we need to, we need to pay. And that proposal is triggering quite a lot of resistance. I think part of this is because people don't simply don't want to pay, but also, and I think that's a more valid argument that they say, yeah, but flying and travel is really built into how academia as a system works. If you think about career progression, there is an expectation that you participate in conferences, that you present your work, that you network with scholars elsewhere, and that you do that face to face. And the pandemic has shown that we can do some of this online, but I think everyone has been also disenchanted by uh, online conferences. And I think what we'll see this summer is a huge return where people have this releasing this pent up demand for in-person travel and, and conference participation. So we'll see a lot, probably more of that than we've seen in uh, pre-COVID uh, years. So I would, th this just goes to show how some of these, uh, so th some of these factors that shape the demand are really f shaped beyond the, tra the, the, the transport system. And we need to think about this in a much more comprehensive manner. And of course, some studies in business on business, focusing on business travel have been doing this, but I think we need much more work along these lines. We also need to think about pluralizing interventions. And I think we need to, th we need to think about different sets of policies that need to be packaged into policy packages for different kinds of aeromobility. And, you can, you can carve up the cake in, in different ways, but uh, a, a seemingly sensible, if somewhat rough, classification would be that you do different things for city tourism, for mass tourism, for business travel, and for these elite mobilities I've been talking about. And the policy packages are really one way of reducing unintended effects, which I'll be talking about a lot more in the next Hour. Now, this classification here is not exhaustive. The packages will have to be adapted to geographical context, and they have to be developed through deliberative processes. So it's not up to us as academics to say what they would look like. And I think they would differ in terms of the emphasis that you place on localization and regionalization, shifting to different modes, uh, sort of if we're thinking, for instance, about high-speed travel, that may work well for city tourism and for perhaps business travel, but that isn't less, will play less of a role, I would say, for, for, for a lot of mass uh, tourism. We can think about mandatory offsetting, technology, and so on, in, in different combinations for these different types of travel. This will all be very difficult, there's no, no question about it, but it's, it's just required. And in doing that, we will also need to think about justice. And here, I think it's really important that we heed the lessons of the original just transition movement. Remember at the very start of this series I was talking about where this term originated. It originated in the labor movement in the US in the 1970s and 80s when uh, unions were um, challenging the closure of uh, polluting industries for environmental reasons and were demanding inv investment in alternative uh, employment uh, and, and economic structure change. And I think this is really important as well. If we want to reduce aviation, particularly on the tourism side, there will have to be alternative economic development models be put in place. And I think this is also a case where this, this, this issue of retributive justice comes into place, because I think a lot of that investment will have to come for historical reasons from Global North countries and Global North investors. Uh, there will have to be much more openness, transparency, 
with regard to infrastructure development. And I think we need to understand infrastructure here in, in, in a broad sense. So it's both material infrastructures like airports and tourist resorts, but also the immaterial infrastructures, the regulations, the arrangements that allow the offshoring of wealth that underpins much of these elite mobilities. All these kinds of issues will need to be addressed um, in, in all of this. And one thing we can do as academics is also support local activists. And airport expansion is one area where there's a lot of work that, that can be done. And sort of from my own experience and some of the work that we're doing in Oxford, in, in cities both like Leeds and Bristol, which both have very ambitious plans for reducing car travel and reducing emissions from local travel, but at the same time are very keen to expand their airports. So that disjuncture is something that the activists have seized upon, but I think it's something that academics can, can, can draw bigger attention to. Conclusions then. As always, reduce the three bullet points. I think what I hope that you get from this is that we need to do much more work on long distance mobilities than we have been doing and some people in this room have been doing work on that and that's great, but we need much more. We need to look at questions of injustice in this and I think there is a strong, I, I would put forward as a hypothesis that many of these injustices have been intensified by the recent pandemic. We'll have to work towards just transitions. That's hugely difficult, but I also think it is achievable and we should make it happen. Thank you very much.
So welcome to the ninth lecture of this series. And this lecture is sort of paired to the previous one, where I talked about long distance mobilities as one tricky issue in thinking about transitions, transformations to low carbon mobility in, in a socially just manner. There's a range of other tricky aspects, I guess, but one I wanted to single out in particular and that's the topic of this lecture, and that's about unintended consequences of various types of interventions. And that's, um, it's, it's quite a diverse field, I would, I would say. We're probably most familiar with this version of unintended consequences, which is the, the, the perennial debate about induced traffic. Uh, you want to reduce congestion by building more capacity, um, and then it fills up because you've induced demand. And um, the controversy is ongoing, maybe not so much about whether these effects exist, but about how big they are. I think there's still differences on that in the academic literature. But perhaps more interesting than that debate, I find the very limited uptake of these ideas outside of academia. This is changing for this particular type of situation where you see some recognition of this in policy processes and certainly by anti-car lobbies in the States and also in Europe. But I think on the whole, these questions don't get as much attention outside of academia as they deserve. So I want to talk about unintended effects, unintended consequences this uh, this block and uh, I want to sort of try to differentiate between different kinds of unintended consequence consequences so I'm going to also talk about not only whether effects are intended but also whether they can be anticipated and that brings us to questions of knowing, not knowing, unknowing that I want to talk about. And once we've done that in a more conceptual sense, I want to talk more empirical examples with a focus on rebound effects. So let's start with a simple two axes. On the one hand, vertical, we've got sort of intendedness and the, the, the horizontal axis is, is on, on anticipation, of course. Oh, sorry. That part of the diagram doesn't make a lot of sense because something cannot be unintended, uh, sorry, unanticipated and, and intended. So we've got these three spaces um, left, these three quadrants. And you could argue they can be seen as collections of effects that differ in terms of the degree to which they are desirable. It's not completely as clear cut as, as it would seem, so it's mostly desirable, often undesirable, and bottom left, it's, it's a mixed bag of, of different things. Now, the literature often focuses on to what extent these unintended effects can be managed and how we might do that. And I've talked already about policy packaging. This is one way in which we can, can, can do this. But I think we can understand this axis of anticipation also as an axis about knowing, about knowledge, and to what extent things can be known and are known. And this sort of can be developed a little bit further by going back to some old work by geographer Nigel Thrift from the mid-1980s in the time that he was still very much interested in the theory of, uh, of structuration, where he talks about five types of not knowing. And uh, he calls them unknown, outside the frame of meaning, undisputed, undiscussed, hidden, and distorted. Um, where unknown are things that are simply impossible to know for a community of researchers or practitioners in a particular place and time. They are genuine surprises. Or in the, world of the, in the words of the late Donald Rumsfeld, unknown unknowns. Outside the frame of meaning are things, knowledges that are not understood. 
for instance, because you are grounded in a different culture or, so, or social experience from whatever it is that you're trying to, to study. When I was doing work in the Philippines on, on, on minibus use and jeepney use, um, people were sort of very much talking about that through the lens of religion and, and their faith in, in God. And for me, it was really difficult to get my head around simply because it was completely outside my limited, partial situated frame of uh, meaning. Undiscussed, our knowledges are perhaps best understood through the example of embodied and tacit knowledges. There's a huge literature on tacit knowledge in, in economic geography, of course, but in travel demand, travel behavior, we have examples of this as well. Earlier in the series, I've talked about, um, about cycling and the role of sweat and the cultural construction of sweaty bodies. Um, I think that's one of these as aspects that a lot of people we know about as an every, on an everyday level, but often does not make it into our institutionalized knowledges and, and the way we, our discursive knowledge as, as, ex as academics. And then there are these hidden knowledges that can be done actively or, uh, or less so. And then we're talking about strategic ignorance, perhaps. And I think there's a lot of that going on in certain policy discourses and certainly in advocacy discourse. I'll say a little bit more about that. And then finally, distorted knowledges are represented unfaithfully. And I think, again, it's not un common, there are exaggerations of the benefits of certain infrastructure provision and that's sort of the work of Ben Fluthberg is, is a classic case, sort of his work on, on mega projects is a very good example of, of how actually some of the representations that have fed into the, uh, the legitimization of these, these projects can be understood as um, distortion. So if we plot these categories into the space that I've created, then it may look like this. We see sort of the unknown and outside frame of meaning more on the unanticipated side. The hidden distorted sit more in the middle, slightly towards the, 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 the right hand side. All of this, of course, differs according to context and community. So actually we, knew, we, would need, we could add a third dimension to this diagram, which sort of tries to capture how this interplay of pictures in this two-dimensional two -dimensional space, how that differs between communities, between different social groups. And I think that is important and that is something I will return to later. But let's talk a little bit more about this axis of anticipation, because I've already kind of suggested that this is an, uh, an axis of knowledge and it can be imagined to run from genuine not knowing, so something that is impossible to know, to complete knowledge. And on the genuine not, knowing, not knowing side, we've got what is known in the, in the literature um, on uncertainty as epistemic, uncertainty where our knowledge falls short and ontic uncertainty that is uncertainty that is in the world that we study is very inherent a variability inherent indeterminacy in the world that we're studying and that may be a cause of the surprises that we uh, were sometimes exposed to now somewhere along this axis there is an area where that strategic not knowing can be placed, where potential effects of an intervention remain somehow in this undiscussed for various reasons. And I think this is an interesting area to be attentive to. And it is where questions of non-discussion and of hiding actively play out. So all of this amounts to what I would call a politics of effect-related knowledges, where there are all kinds of differences that need to be taken into account, because we've got limits to what we can know and to what extent we recognize uh, 
those limits. We've got these different configurations of undiscussed, hidden, and distorted knowledges, all of which differs socially, spatially, temporally, and also has different justice implications. So quite a, a whole set of issues to untangle and to get our heads around. So let's move to some examples. And I want to focus on two uh, in, in the remainder of this, this talk. One is about gentrification induced by transport uh, infrastructure development, and the other is about rebound effects of uh, uh, interventions that are meant to reduce um, energy consumption first and foremost. And rebound effects are sort of effects where the saved resources are plucked into the same or other behaviors so that the efficiency gains that you originally tried to achieve are partially or wholly cancelled out. I've shown you this picture before in, in one of the earlier lectures. This is York Boulevard in North Los Angeles, a uh, mixed area, of ethnically and socioeconomically mixed. It's seeing a lot of gentrification, not primarily induced by transport investment, I should say. But what we do see is that the developers, the private developers, as I explained earlier, are putting in infrastructure that supports cycling for a number of reasons. And I think it's a really interesting example because you could say that for the developers, gentrification in this case is an intended and an anticipated and a desirable effect is something they, or they actually want to achieve. That that may cause displacement may not be anticipated and, anticip and, and intended as explicitly. It, it probably remains undiscussed. So this is where one case of strategic not knowing is emerging. And that may generate new or reinforce existing mobility injustices. If we think about community activists as another community, uh, as another community involved in this, uh, sort of interested in these issues, they would say that the, both the gentrification and the displaced are probably anticipated and intended by the developers. And certainly from their, as, from their perspective, they are clearly undesirable. Policy makers and cycling activists it's tricky to position them into that diagram. They may, probably we could say that the gentrification and the displacement are in balance, probably largely unintended and to some extent perhaps anticipated. But it's quite likely that here too there is a degree of non-discussion going on. Now, whether that's actively hiding, um, I, do, I wouldn't want to claim, but I can certainly see that there is sort of very partial discussion explicitly of what these kinds of interventions may be bringing about. There may also be, however, some genuine not knowing because some of these effects are simply outside the frame of meaning of some of the people involved. People may be so siloed into thinking about short-term effects of certain measures that they don't think about the longer-term effects that various types of transport investment may be, occur may be inducing and particularly with this case where the, 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 the infrastructure is very modest I think is actually quite likely to happen. But this simple example begins to show that true discursive knowledge that offers plausible, robust and traceable insights into intended, anticipated and desired effects of interventions by state and other actors are key to just transformations in urban mobility. And in fact, I want to push that point a little bit further. This is a diagram that I've not shown you in this particular form earlier, but I've talked about all these terms on this diagram. And it sort of basically comes down to this argument that we need to think about justice 
in this pluralistic sense where we're not only talking about distribution but also about recognition and procedural justice and where recognition justice has sort of multiple manifestations including epistemic justice. So considering how different groups or collectives understand the understand and construe the intended nature, anticipation and desirability of outcomes that interventions in urban mobility generate can aid our understanding of how just changes in urban mobility are and can be. This is because this helps us to see how different groups understand and construe questions of distributive justice, which is about the distribution of costs and benefits. It also brings epistemic justice into sharp focus, which, as I've explained before, has these two legs of testimonial and hermeneutical justice, where testimonial justice is about the capacity of groups and individuals to offer relevant knowledge and insights, and hermeneutical justice is about the capacity of knowledge production processes to be influenced by the knowledge, the knowledges that have been communicated by those groups and individuals. And for these knowledge production processes to adequately respond to and adapt to those insights that have been offered. So one way to operationalize the rather abstract notion of epistemic justice in the context of interventions in urban mobility is by analyzing in how far different groups and collectives in the city are able to communicate their understanding of which effects of interventions are intended, anticipated and desirable to other groups and in how far different knowledge creation processes are able to absorb other actors' understanding, understandings and adapt to them. So that ultimately, at a higher level of abstraction, some kind of consensus or at least alignment of perspectives emerges on the basis of which progressives, progressive forms of procedurally just collective action to ensure greater distribution justice becomes possible. In other words, a more even distribution of the costs and benefits of one or more interventions that will ultimately, reduced, ultimately result in reduced CO2 emissions and greater climate resilience in urban mobility. So what I'm trying to argue is that we really need to look at how different groups understand this interplay of intended, anticipated, desired effects. And um, I think that is a really useful approach to think about questions of, of justice and, and helps us to understand some of the unintended consequences that various interventions may have. I've shown you this diagram before from a paper by Lynn in the Annals of the AAG about transit-induced gentrification. I think in this case, the effects are much less intended uh, than with the cycling example that I just gave, um, not least because the timescales are longer, the situations are sort of we're talking about different spatial scales, it's all more complex to, to understand what is, what is going on here. I would say there's some genuine not knowing here involved as well, not least because the academic literature is really focused on what is happening in, in sort of phases two and three, sort of situations where in relative uh, uh, transit poverty, in transit deserts, new transit infrastructure is being placed and what then happens and that's where you see these, these, the disemphasis on the displacement that is associated with the, the gentrification. And I would say there's much less literature that really focus on, on what is here is shown as phases four and five. Still, in the wider debates on gentrification induced by transit-oriented development across academia, activism and policy, there may be various forms of strategic not knowing going on with, for instance, TOD critics of various backgrounds uh, 
trying to exaggerate the gentrification effects that are being produced and likewise and, and simultaneously protagonists not discussing all of the effects that may be happening. And the reasons for not discussing effects may be multiple. I think it may have to do to some extent about an evidence base not being in place, like I was trying to explain with the unevenness of the way this topic is treated in the literature. But I think a lot of it also has to do with what I would call audiencing. That is, I suspect often what is going on particularly in policy contexts and advocacy contexts. If you want to get something implemented, you need to tell powerful and simple stories that travel well. And you try to take out some of these complexities, some of these ambiguous effects, and you try to sort of come up with a strong, a simple story, like well, acting like a politician, you could say, sort of talk in straight, it, in straight terms about what may be happening. And embellishments like complicated long-term effects don't, they just model that message, so get uh, marginalized, consciously or unconsciously. What we are getting at here then is that thinking about knowledge in relation to just transformations in urban mobility is more complex than I have previously suggested. Because we also need to bring into the mix frames of meaning and in particular also this question of knowledge communication in relation to the, the, the knowledge that gets generated. And it's that question of communication that I want to, want to talk about a little bit more in relation to vehicle automation, which I've talked about before. This is a figure that the UK government uses to communicate its understanding of the intended and anticipated effects of vehicle automation. The figure is not produced by the government, it's produced by the SMMT, sort of the bottom right, um, which is the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders in the UK, sort of the, the industry body that uh, unites the, the, the manufacturers and sort of has from the very start that we uh, sort of, th there was this broad debate about vehicle automation, they've been in favor. And this diagram has been taken on by the UK government, uh, which since uh, 2015 or thereabout has been sort of a very strong advocate for investment in um, vehicle automation, as I explained before, it has to do with creating a new industrial base of manufacturing to under, sort of as, as part of the UK economy in the wake of what has happened with the financial crisis. So the emphasis is really put on two things, jobs and safety. The emphasis on jobs is in part because jobs always sell well if you want to get investment secured, but also because the, uh, the, the whole vehicle automation agenda in the UK is driven by, not by the Department for Transport, but by the Department for Business, Energy inve and, and Industrial Strategy. So economic questions are just as important as the transport side. When we talk about safety, we we'll talk about transport is primarily about safety, about lives saved and accidents prevented. Other aspects are not really seen in the government's, uh, the government's communication. Though we know, and there is now a very su substantial literature, that there are many other uh, anticipated and intended effects of that, um, of, of a change towards vehicle automation. This is a table from a paper that I'm currently finishing with Debbie Hopkins, where we've done a Delphi study of experts in transport, energy and urban planning in the UK, uh, where we ask people a whole battery of questions around what would happen with um, uh, vehicle automation, uh, and we, we sort of gave them a series of questions, sort of structured with scales 
on a number of uh, a number of impacts that we thought on the basis of the literature would be likely so we've categorized them into motility mobility resource use externalities um, and they include everything from increases in car ownership increase in vehicle miles decreased use of other modes all the way to road safety reduced carbon emissions and and so on. And what I've done in colors is highlighting the most important ones. Blue are the ones that we would consider desirable. So we can see indeed that increased road safety is according to the experts in our panel coming out quite strongly. It's both likely and it's deemed to be strong. As is an increase in accessibility, more people will be able to get access to a vehicle. It's also what you would expect if you think about people with a disability, older people, children, uh, for instance. Then on the other side, on the negative sides, what we see is very strong belief in additional vehicle miles. And it's actually stronger than I would have expected on the work of people like Zia Wadud and others who've done extensive work on this where uh, I would say on a scale from 0 to 0, 5.1 on average is, is actually pretty strong. People also believe that there will be decreased use of other modes and there will be increased traffic congestion. So quite strong rebound effects you could say where sort of this, this, uh, this intervention will trigger more car use. We got loads of more data to uh, back up that argument. I'm not going to sort of read out the quote, but this is sort of uh, sort of ad additional information uh, that people provided that actually get at some of these unintended consequences and sort of spelling out the rebound. So I would say the community of experts in academia and also beyond, in policy, in NGOs, in consultancy, they're quite well aware of the likelihood of rebound effects happening as one of the unintended consequences. We've also looked at freight, where the picture is a little bit different, where people are actually more positive and expect significantly lower rebound effects, which I guess is good news. And the main reason for that is that they argue freight transport and the decision making by logistic operators is much more driven by a cost basis. And this is sort of really about driving down costs and not really then driving much more. So actually, we, did, we do see strong expectation of Ro additional road safety, but also significant drops in carbon emissions and in air pollutions from freight. And the quote here kind of gets at that. Yeah, we see the similar direction, but different intensities of, of effects because freight travel is less elastic. Um, so quite a few rebound effects that people are very well aware of, but don't make it into a number of the discourses, a number of the knowledges that are being communicated by different actors. We should say that this is only looking at direct rebound effects. This is a diagram I'm going to show you. It's not mine. It's by a colleague with whom I've done some work on, on rebound effects in the past and from whom I've learned a great deal, Professor Steve Sorrell at the University of Sussex, and arguably one of the leading authorities on questions of rebounds effect in, in, in transport. And he sort of always explains the difference between various kinds of rebound effects as follows. If we're talking about uh, fuel standards, fuel efficiency, um, people, it's actually very rational economically because of longer, lower running costs that you would start to drive more so that part of your benefit is, is cancelled out. So those are the direct rebound effects. You may want to use the money you save from driving a, a more efficient vehicle in other ways. You can, for instance, take a holiday, which is an indirect uh, rebound effect. There are transformational rebound effects where sort of these 
may lead into uh, different infrastructural investments which change your whole life and work arrangements. Um, so the, here we're really talking about systemic effects that I haven't seen being properly quantified because it's tremendously difficult. It's already tremendously difficult to get the direct rebound effects uh, quantified properly. We did a piece of work some years ago where we looked at um, increases in, view, in, in uh, fuel efficiency in, in vehicles in the UK over a period from 1970 to uh, uh, 20, 2011, um, where we saw that actually this is quite substantial, but it's especially a lot of work to get meaningful numbers. So in the end, we ended up with something like a, a rebound effect, a direct rebound effect of 20%. In freight, interestingly, S Steve has used the same methodology and then found much higher rebound effects in the region of 50%, 5.0. So really interesting and goes to show that this is really an area that needs more research and uh, needs to be taken more serious and actually also needs to be communicated in different ways probably to policymakers and also of course then get them to also articulate them in what they communicate. Now we've done a little bit of work as part of the study with, with Debbie where we've tried to uh, understand these rebound effects a little bit further. We also did a survey, a Delphi study, with members of the general public in the UK, started off with 2,000 individuals and gave them a series of items on, with Likert scales where they had to indicate to what extent they agreed or disagreed with the statements here. We had more statements, but I'm just focusing on on these four, which is about more miles, different uh, modes of transport. It's about living further from your work and uh, not feeling as much guilt. So uh, you're less likely to, to adopt energy saving uh, technologies in other domains of your life. And if we do some simple analysis on that, we sort of create a scale and of course that's uh, sort of, I've done the, the checks on the Cronbach's alpha. You get a four times five gives you twenty. Uh, gives you a, a, a score between four and and twenty. And you, this is the the, the, the histogram. You see sort of the clear uh, uh, maximum at twelve, which is neither agree nor disagree on all four of the items. But in total, 20% of the people fall on the right-hand side of that. So that's an indication that for these people, for at least 20% of this, this sample, they would expect some degree of rebound effect from um, adopting an autonomous vehicle. And then if we run a regression analysis and with a whole raft of uh, variables, then we see that uh, expected rebound is greater if people are more optimistic about the introduction and benefits of autonomous vehicles. They have more experience with sort of the, the predecessors of the robo taxi, including Uber pool that's included in the uh, past use of hire services, that's an, a, a, a composite of different hire uh, vehicle services. If people are younger, they expect more rebound effects if they have lower incomes and if they live in London. Now, of course, these results are very crude. I would say they're no more than guesstimates of what may happen. But they do raise questions of how rebound effects in the form of extra driving might be reduced. Which brings us to the question of how do we manage rebound effects in all of that? I sort of brought that up earlier in, I think it's still a very important question to think about. And if we can, if we strongly suspect that they may be happening, 
So in other words, if they fall on the known side of this spectrum that I've sketched, then mixing or pack packaging of policies in ways that reduce the risk of distributive injustice may make a lot of sense. So when we're thinking about robo-taxis, we may want to think about how we can embed them in a program to overcome first last mile issues for urban rail BRT systems. Uh, so it's really about making sure that they become part of a much bigger package of measures that sort of seek to stimul stimulate and encourage multimodal transport. If these rebound effects are unknown and if they really fall on the spectrum of unanticipated effects, then it actually makes sense to do experimentation and do that on, uh, before you actually uh, implement something at scale. And we see that fortunately happening more and more these days, sort of. There's, there's quite a bit of literature on, on governing by experiment, how you learn from that and the benefits of that. I'll talk more about that tomorrow when we talk about questions of governance. Um, but there are many, many examples of that. The work that's going on here on sort of the, the, the closing of streets uh, is, is a very good example where it's also where you are monitoring and evaluating the effects of these, these experiments so that you, the city can learn and other places can learn from that so that ultimately it can be rolled out at, at scale. I think that's really good, but it hinges on openness in the social learning and it hinges on these processes being truly reflexive, truly collective. And what we see in some instances, in some past instances, is that that is not happening as much as it should. This is from an earlier study that Debbie and I did on automated vehicles and the automated mobility transition. In, in the UK, where we actually come to the conclusion that the UK government has done a lot of things very well. They've sort of done the experimentation. It's a, it's, there is a degree of procedural justice. But what is lacking is the openness. It's, the, it's not as inclusive, demo, democratic and open as it could have been. So the learning still is behind doors, and in this case is very much because of the political stakes, but also because of the commercial sensitivities, because it's the private, fa the private companies who are driving this agenda. So this question about experimentation is very important, but we need to make sure that the learning is truly, truly collective and truly open. So in terms of managing rebound effects. We need to think about packaging, we need to think about experimentation, but I think we also need to think about and be reflexive about the kind of knowledge that we produce. And I think we need to be really humble and, and, and show humility regarding that knowledge that we're producing. We need to respect questions of ontic uncertainty, which I don't think transport studies as a discipline is particularly good at. And I sort of always try to keep in mind this, this, this claim that Isabel Stengers, the Belgian philosopher that I've, ta who I've talked about a number of times during this lecture, always keeps making this point, one never knows what an object is capable of. You never quite know what happens if you do something. You always have to be able, have to show that openness, that, that humility, and let yourselves be, be surprised. And I think that also means that we may want to reflect on the kinds of theoretical and methodological approaches that we use and that we rely on. I think we need to do much more in terms of respecting and understanding embodied non-discursive knowledges. I think we need to rethink questions of causality. I've spoken about that in an earlier lecture, so you can look that back if you want to follow that. I think it is also really important to think about uh, 
how rebound effects, rebound dynamics are differentiated socially and spatially. I think that's really something the, 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 the literature hasn't done enough of. And I think what that means that we, we, we experiment with different theoretical frameworks. In, in some of the work I have been, been doing um, myself on trying to understand the, the, the consequences of the adoption of smartphone apps for behavior change. You can do that with the theory of planned behavior and you can come up with a really nice study, but it is a very rigid framework because the, the concepts are all predefined and the causal linkages are predefined as well. And if you write a paper and you say, well, actually, these links are not quite the same way as the theoretical model has suggested, you run the risk of your paper being rejected by reviewers because you've not done it rigorously. So there's another way of trying to think about other frameworks that allow you to, uh, to do things differently. And I've sort of, there, there are the frameworks from, from within um, Foucauldian literature that you can draw upon that allow you to be much more flexible in trying to understand what is happening. And I think part of what that means is using different methods, using more ethnography, more observational methods, being in a, in a way more empiricist at the start and sort of work in an inductive way towards new theoretical frameworks that you can then work with in subsequent research. So this whole question of rebound effects, both in terms of understanding them and managing them, is really difficult and a fascinating area that we need to pay more attention to. And as the example of the automated vehicle shows, I think it's really important if we think about just transformations in mobility. So we need to un consider unintended effects of interventions in mobility systems. And that means we also need to theorize them in different ways. I've tried to make some uh, inroads in this today with sort of thinking about different, uh, thinking about anticipation and knowledgeability, desirability, different types of not knowing in all of this, but there's much more work required to make sense of these kinds of relations. This is all quite elusive, quite complex, but we also will have to get some kind of handle on them and starting with policy packaging and with epistemic humility is a decent point of departure from which we can work further. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions?